Today's episode of Northern Lights is presented by North Star Law Group, your trusted partner in Minnesota's burgeoning legal cannabis industry. Whether you're just starting out or looking to expand, attorney Jen Riza and her team will help you understand the latest developments, scope out risks, and find a compliant path forward in this rapidly changing field. Visit NorthStarLaw.com and let North Star Law Group guide you through the legal landscape with confidence. Hey everyone, Tanner here. We're out this week taking some very needed R&R after the legislative session ended, but we still wanted to share with you a panel this week that we thought was super helpful. Brewing a budding market, THC Beverages in Minnesota, was a panel at the last Canna Connect conference that I actually got to be a part of. We figured we'd help share this out, think it's some really helpful information. So check it out, and we'll be back in your feeds with our regular episode next week. Thanks, all. Wonderful. I'm going to be right by the speaker. We'll see how that goes. All right. Howdy, everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming out. I'm really excited to be able to be one of the first people to be able to lead a panel here at uh, Canna Connect number four. Um, big shout out to Steve and Canna Connect for having us out today. Um, a little introduction to myself. I'm Tanner with the Minnesota Cannabis College. I'm really excited to be able to help lead this panel today, talking about brewing a budding market, the THC beverage market here in Minnesota. This has definitely been one of those markets that really took Minnesota and I think the country by storm. Looking at where cannabis products were two, three years ago, beverages existed. They were definitely part of the market, but looking at where they are today, it's been a pretty big change. So I'm excited to be able to dig into that change, dig into what the future of cannabis beverages look like here in Minnesota. And we've got a great panel of people that uh, Steve put together that we're going to be talking to today. So I'm going to do like a little brief introduction. And then most of today, you're not going to be hearing me talk. You're going to be hearing them talk, which is far better. Um, but first, we've got Andy Herzog. So Andy is the THC brand manager at Modest. While Modest produces in-house favorites like Tint and Melt, he also helps to connect growing and aspiring brands to uh, the Minneapolis-based and traditionally alcohol-focused brewing industry, helping them to find a role in the cannabis market. Um, we got Logan Fleischman, who is the owner and CEO of Zero Proof NA Beverage House in Northeast Minneapolis. He helps to connect customers to high-quality products made with alcohol, showing that other beverages, even those with cannabis, can find a way into Minnesotans' lives. Lauren Bertrand, no, I'm just kidding. Lauren, Lauren Bertrand is the field sales and marketing manager for Warehouse Beverage Co. And in that role, she collaborates with distributor partners and helps Wink to reach their goals in Minnesota's market. And then finally, we've got Chris Fleem, who, who is the brand manager for Hohenstein's Inc., a locally owned and operated distribution company with a track record of serving Minnesotans for over 70 years. So we've got a, a lot of expertise that we have on this panel today, and I'm excited to jump into it. Um, first off, as a very brief introduction, aside from me just sort of saying who you are, what brings you to the cannabis industry here in Minnesota? Sort of what's your connection and how did you arrive here? Uh, my name's Andy. I work for Modest Brewing. Um, cannabis has been a big part of my life personally for at least half of it. Um, and really, uh, I think I shout out Tom Thorpe probably every time I get on a microphone in this setting. But uh, if you don't know Thomas at Granny's, he and I go back to seventh, eighth grade. He showed up two days after the initial legislation that allowed us to make these beverages with water saw in hand. And uh, we were in the game like six, less than six weeks later, we had a product launched. Um, so huge credit to him. It's just networking, I think. Um, going back to Hopkins High 2010, there's so many people <laughs> out there and in here that have some connection to, to that network of people. Um, and uh, it's been a really cool to be able to bring that to the background I was building professionally in beer, brewing, liquor retail, um, et cetera, to be able to inject my love for cannabis in uh, this huge boom uh, has been massive. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm Logan. I uh, also went to Hopkins. I didn't know you were a Hopkins guy. Um, and uh, we used to call it Potkins back in the day. That's what we were known as. I uh, Yeah, I'd say I, um, again, long time kind of cannabis con consumer. Um, I watched it help uh, over the years some dear family members uh, through bouts with cancer. So uh, definitely in 
involved in sort of the health and wellness side of the plant. And now as we see it broadening into Main Street, the, you know, recreational side of the plant that we all love, I think, as well. Um, I worked for many, many years in fine wine and spirit distribution and quit drinking alcohol uh, about three years ago and started exploring all these like incredible non-elk options, NA beers, NA wines, really cool like mocktails and NA spirits and was ordering a lot of this stuff direct to my house for personal consumption. And I uh, thought it would be really cool to try and bring a bunch of unique NA products under one roof uh, to a storefront uh, for people like myself, for people curious in that space to come in shop and see, you know, what is sort of like leading this new category and new products that are becoming available all the time. And then with the cannabis beverages really starting to uh, drive this category of the plant into more of a traditional, you know, like NA option, effect driven, you know, non-alcoholic product. It's starting to live on liquor store shelves. They're starting to put it as a, a category. And it's really driving right across the uh, right along parallel to the NA industry as in a whole. Uh, so that is a huge part of uh, what we have at the store. Definitely. Um, I, I guess flipping back, I spent many years in Colorado uh, in my early 20s chasing a snowboard career, uh, but wound up doing a lot of um, brokerage from processors into manufacturers when it came to distillate and like plant material in the cannabis space. Worked with a friend of mine many years ago to develop a certified organic uh, extract process for bubble hash rosin, like dab wax. And then we sold that SOP out to larger marijuana companies. Uh, and then I came back to Minnesota and built a career in the fine wine and spirit industry. And now I run a nice little shop in Northeast Minneapolis. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Lauren um, with Warehouse Beverage. So kind of coming from the supplier side here. Um, I My career was born and raised in the beverage industry. Um, I started out in spirits, in wine, um, got involved in the beer side of the industry right around the time of the seltzer boom. Um, and then uh, through... COVID and all the craziness that the pandemic brought our industry um, opened up the doors to kind of look around at some other things. I was involved, <clears throat> excuse me, on the craft side uh, here locally with the lab um, and Bev Source. So the lab was a public facing tap room, but also had a pilot facility and full blown quality testing lab on site. So we actually worked closely with a lot of craft breweries at that time. Um, and still to this day, um, and they will test and work on batching formulations, ingredients. I was actually at the lab during um, the time when the bill in Minnesota was signed in to allow these consumables with the max cap. So it was almost the next day we were getting these water solubles and all these new ingredients and terpenes and, and things dropped on our doorstep off, you know, right off University of St. Paul. And it was this watch this whole new category literally from conceptualization to commercialization for some people happen. So really dove into kind of in a similar sense of Logan. I was taking a step back with alcohol in my own personal life um, during that time and seeing that there was so many different options and, and people working on and very passionate about ingredients and different forms of, of functional ingredients um, that's not alcohol, but can still have fun without alcohol. Um, so, you know, I really drove a passion down that path of just real ingredients, good processes. Um, always joked around that I've studied grapes, I've studied hops, you know, someday I'll study cannabis and never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be here now doing exactly that, at least at this point. But um, I officially, I did some consulting and contracting with a few of the brands that came out of the pilot facility um, and help them with some commercialization structures, a lot of great brands, ideas, formulations, but no real true plan to go to market. And where a lot of my strength and experience lies is working with distributor partners, working with um, local retail accounts. You know, we talk about this three tier system, but I get to sit and work with that fourth tier two, which is our consumers, right? Activations like this, talking to the consumers, educating consumers, um, but also then supporting every step along the way, all the way from the supplier down to the customer actually bring the product home and putting on their shelf. So I really dive into that space and kind of speaking those languages and building those relationships and kind of maintaining that 
integrity around market. So that's me. Thank you, Lauren. Um, my name's Chris Freem. I've uh, been in the adult beverage industry since um, about early 2000s. Um, worked in a bar and then left the bar scene to go work for a local company called Crispin Cider, a um, small startup out of Northeast. Um, in a matter of years, we built that thing up to be sold to Molson Coors. So I actually worked for a giant like Molson Coors for about three and a half years as well. And then I left there to go work for a regional brewery out of Colorado, one called Oscar Blues, um, which they have now also gotten into the cannabis space since then. Um, and then shortly after that, I went to go to the distributor side. Uh, it was about eight years ago. Uh, I've been a brand manager for seven years. Um, and I've been what we like to call a legacy THC user for 20 years. Um, so right when I became a brand manager, I told our ownership, uh, once THC becomes a thing, like that's what I want to manage. That's what I want to look at and follow. Uh, I did not think it was going to happen this quickly. And then when it did happen, I didn't think it was going to blow up and become something that quickly. Um, uh, so us at Hohensteins, we, uh, sold our first THC beverage in August of 2022, uh, August 8th, um, uh, about a month after, uh, the, the July bill went through. Um, and then since then, uh, it's been about a two or three meetings a week with brands and beverages from around the country who are all trying to come to Minnesota. Um, we've seen the entire gamut of, uh, of the beverages, the styles, the flavors. Um, and really one of the most interesting things, most fun things to see is like how the market has been telling us what is working and what's not working. Um, the different styles and everything. We all have our ideas of what you know, this market is going to look like, we like to think that we can influence it, but the market will always tell us what's going to work and what's not going to work. And then we have to pivot around it. Um, and we all had our own ideas of what was going to work and what wasn't. And it's been really fun to see the things we were right on, uh, the things we were wrong on, um, and how quickly we can change and pivot and move and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, a lot of our, a lot of what we do is just between the retailers and the suppliers. So work with Lauren and work with Logan is kind of the, the in between. And, uh, <clears throat> one other thing I just kind of really want to touch on with the beverage space, uh, especially and why a distributor works so well in this space is that beverages are an extremely freight intensive product. Uh, a case of water beverages costs or weighs about 40 pounds. Each case, a keg is 160 some pounds. Um, Whereas flour, gummies, edibles, like we literally talk about grams and ounces and a couple of pounds when we're shipping those. So um, the distributor model has really worked well for the beverage space because of that. Um, so I believe that's why I'm here is to kind of help talk more about why it's working here and how it's separating from the rest of the hemp industry, the rest of the marijuana industry, and even the parallels to alcohol yet it's completely different than alcohol. So um, it's just been a lot of fun. So yeah, perfect. I appreciate it. So um, outside of doing cannabis, I actually, I teach high school social studies. And so part of my deal is if any of you guys think of a question sort of as a follow-up to something that they say, definitely feel free to ask it. The one thing that I request is that you do raise your hand so I can give you the microphone so the people online can hear as well, but definitely feel free to ask a question as well. So we're going to be talking through a lot of the industry tonight looking at everything from how beverages are made, but also at how they get distributed. But the question that I had first is, well, the stream of commerce to creating a product that's flower based might be a little bit more traditionally known, sort of looking for genetics, growing out that product and figuring out how to package that product. There's a lot of things that go into figuring out how to create a cannabis beverage, a lot of different components to consider. Can you talk a little bit about what it looks like to go from, hey, I have an idea to a product to actually getting it created and i'm going to ask you to use a specific example um i would like a pickle thc seltzer so tell me how can i get that made okay you can go for it. well specifically having tanner ask that question is fun because i have made a beverage with tanner and tanner showed up with a recipe already written which as a producer oh my god <laughs> i'm gonna assume that you've already bench tested this and maybe there's a right answer but um uh, that's a great jumping off point, I would say, in a market that is super flooded. Um, and uh, we had kind of um, alluded to the, the hard seltzer boom a couple of years ago. And I think that's kind of what's starting to happen and homogenize in this industry is how do you not be redundant? Everybody's got 
a sparkling water with essence of mango, berry, whatever your, your five basic fruit flavors. Um, so you do have to look outside of if you, if you want something to stand out, it can't be just another repackaged different label on the same product. As far as pickle juice goes first, um, <laughs> where are you sourcing it? How does it interact with your emulsion? Do you have, uh, are you able to replicate that in a shelf stable environment, uh, canned and packaged over time and track degradation of your emulsion if there is any? Um, there's tons of scientific white papers we would need to read first. Um, but in the spirit of modest, I would say, sure, let's figure that out. Um, you're going from bench test trials, which Tanner knows you showed up with a source for lab grade terpenes and an exact uh, fruit ratio and preferred supplier for his uh, fruit puree. That was killer. Um, you need to vet uh, how is this going to scale? Um, where am I going to get 110 gallons, let's say, of pickle juice? Are we going to make that ourselves? Do we have the <laughs> the the um, the wherewithal and the the resources to do that? Um, and then how are you going to market it where, you know, uh, Modest is the largest self-distributed brewery in the state. Um, we have a footprint, but are we going to be able to bring it to the places that you want us to put that? Do you have a specific audience in mind for that? Is there a venue or an event or something with that in mind? And is this something that you are doubling down on? This is a brand you're committed to. Are you going to do this year round? Is this a seasonal thing? Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of other questions beyond just like pickle juice emulsion can. Um, so yeah. yeah. I would say that you would want to start with cucumbers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say you threw me, you threw me off handing the mic to me right away. Um, you know, I think for me coming from, you know, the field sales and marketing side, I can speak a little to what I overshadowed and saw at the lab of, again, the ingredients and what all goes into it. And I could, in my own brain, tell you that process, but not as good as any of them. So I won't touch on that side. But um, for me, when it comes to these brands and a lot of the brands that I was working on early on coming out of the lab, they had the product. They had it in hand. It was ready to go. Um, but what they needed to strengthen was the materials that they were going to use to go out and tell their story. So on top of making sure you have a solid product and you you have something there that's worthwhile, make sure that your story stands up to that as well. Um, the integrity of your brand also has a message that follows it. So making sure that that message is clear, it's not too cluttered, um, it's easy to relay. You're not going to miss a ton of information down the telephone pole that will happen. Um, if you can have those clear, concise messages, um, you know, a simple plan of action on, on social media. And so much of that I say all the time, you can spend a lot of money in digital side of the world. But so much of that can also just happen organically. And you'll see so much growth by just being authentic to yourself and your brand and your message through those channels that's going to allow yourself to build up an audience and build that trust directly with that consumer without being face-to-face. -face. So again, one of those things just over the last decade in this industry, how much that has grown to be such a priority in getting your message across. Um, I would say that, just make sure you have a solid, simple plan to go out, have the materials ready. It doesn't have to be a million dollar marketing budget to make something happen. You can really have strong materials from a print shop and you know a team of brand ambassadors doing tastings in store and some authentic social media, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna echo what everybody else has said. The common thread here is that you have to have a plan do not just limp into making a beverage because as I said, for us, just distributing and shipping is really expensive, but all of the products that go into a beverage, the can, the liners, the emulsion, the marketing, the packaging, the cardboard, all of that is way more expensive than a lot of other products that are out there. Um, so if you're going to do a beverage, just don't limp into it, have a plan. Again, the plan doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it just requires time and a lot of questions. Find people who know how to do these type of things. Like any of one of us up here would be more than happy to like sit down and have a conversation and, you know, share the expertise that we have of what, what works, what doesn't, and 
have it all on paper before you bring it to the manufacturers. Um, because obviously they, they love that. And as a distributor, I love it when a brand comes to me with a complete brand. Uh, when I ask them like, well, what's, who's your target customer? Like, well, we're going to figure that out. It's like, no, we want to know who, who you're going for. Where do you want to, where, what store do you want this in? Do you want it in a liquor store? Do you want it in a health and wellness store? Do you want it in a hair salon? Like, what are you making? Who's your customer? Where are you guys looking for? Um, and, and stuff like that. So yeah, the, the overarching thing is have a plan, have a, co a concise plan. And I'd even say have a plan B. Um, if plan A doesn't work, have something where you can pivot and recoup a lot of the cost, but have a plan B as well. Cause yeah, you just don't want to get caught with your pants down. Like if a, the emulsion for some reason doesn't work with the pickle juice, oh, now you've got a lot of cases of weird tasting pickle beverage um and it's going to be really hard to move it and sell it um so yeah have a plan b what are you going to do with pickle juice that didn't work out i don't know so i'll i'll expand on my cucumber comment just from the uh, lens of a, a retailer um specifically to you know, someone walking in to sell me a pickle flavored THC beverage. I am all about this, this category. It's booming. I think we are starting to get some data back on the, the subcategories within the beverage space, the flavors, the styles on, you know, what's being looked for, what's being pulled off the shelves more than some other subcategories. But also I think that as it, we don't have enough data to know does something like the you know this pickle juice comes out it's a brand this is a you know limited release i would probably encourage if the man the person was coming to me um but lean into that uh you know sort of marketing strategy like if your brand is to make these like wild things and they actually taste good you know have the next one in line that you know maybe we're coming out with like nacho cheese flavored you know ipa or something you know like and that continues to like build the brand on pull through these like limited drops super unique and i think there's something to that in a marketing standpoint so what i'm hearing is that there's a chance but, yeah, all right cool all right it's wonderful all right be afraid. so taking the analogy even one step further steve would tell me not to but we're going to I'm that creator. I have a cannabis product that I've made, pickle juice beverage, whatever be it. And I'm really feeling strongly like this is something that I want to get out there. Maybe I've started as selling out of my car, distributing to people, and I'm realizing, man, this scale is not working for me. Can you talk a little bit about what each of your brands or what your roles bring to uh, a cannabis brand? Maybe like from a distributor standpoint, what can you offer to a cannabis brand from a sales standpoint, retailer, et cetera? Uh, we'll go in the opposite order this time. Yeah, there you go. Start yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, although it doesn't give me a whole lot of time to kind of think about it. Um, yeah, so uh, one common misconception with a lot of distributors is that we choose favorites. Um, we, I currently work for technically a Molson Coors is probably one of our biggest brands, um, but there is no difference to us between uh, a Molson Coors brand or like Lawrence brand Wink. They're to us boxes on a truck and we want to sell as much as we possibly can. And we want to make it as efficient as we possibly can. So we want to fill that truck with everything. Um, and it's going to be across the board. It's going to be expensive stuff. It's going to be cheap stuff. It's going to be sodas. It's going to be beer. It's going to be THC. It's going to be a, a, a lot of various things. So what, what, what I would want to hear from a new brand and a new re uh, a new supplier coming in is again, kind of what that plan is, where do they want to go and how does it fit into certain spaces and how does it fit also within our business as a, as a distributor, if it's something that we don't have and it fills something within our portfolio, we are way more likely to bring something in too. So we want to hear that story. We want to hear why your product and your brand is so much different than everybody else's. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, how much branding's behind it, how much money you're putting into social media or anything like that. We just want to know why you believe your brand is going to work and how is it, how is it going to work for us? How are we going to take your brand and get it onto trucks? Um, so again, a lot of that kind of goes back to that, the original plan and what you're looking for uh, within that space. And that's why I say, yeah, don't, don't just, make it just to make it like have a, have a reason behind it. And honestly, the story is one of the biggest things, one of the best selling stories. And, and also how are you going to support the brand after 
after we bring it to a retailer, how is the retailer going to feel supported and sell it through their shop as well? Um, a lot of that comes from the suppliers because nobody's going to tell your story better than you because you lived it from day one. And also you wake up every day and your biggest priority is going to be your brand where within the distributor space, we have a lot of brands. And again, we don't care which brand is which we try to give them all the same amount of attention, but at the the realization is we have a lot of brands. So how are you going to get the focus, our focus for your brand as well? That's really important for a distributor. So how do you do that, Warren? Well, yeah, I was going to say now that he just gave you a bit of a job description of how we work together. So um, that's my job. That's where I step in, right? As somebody working in, in what we call on the supplier side. So coming from, you know, the brand side. Um, I maintain and, and help grow those relationships and markets. So again, I get to have the opportunity to really hit all three or four because the customers are the most important um, segment there. So I coming from initially a distributor level um, career in out in market, selling a bunch of different brands, priorities are changing every single month. And it's been five or six, maybe seven years since I've been in a, in a role managing, you know, a huge portfolio from different suppliers at the distributor level. Um, and, and as that has even grown, the amount it's grown, not just with THC brands, but seltzer brands and craft brands and everybody else's brands and grandma's brands and <laughs> your mom's brands, like all the brands that are coming in. Um, as I got to the supplier side, it was, it, it you know, we see the growth of these brand development representatives or these brand ambassadors that are becoming more of those relationship builders, um, market development managers, state managers, specific to suppliers. So that's where I sit, where I am that in market person that can help supplement where I know Chris's team is so overloaded and we can't be 24 seven on their brain, on their mind. But I know I can go into these accounts and help supplement um, what they're there to do. Their elevator pitch on Wink um, is, is not quite what I can cover to them to help explain that, you know, this is what we've done. This is what we're doing. This is how we're supporting, you know, locally, nationally, federally, legislatively, all these things that we're trying to make sure everybody is getting the correct messages. They're getting the right information, education. Um, I, I can come in and maybe find some time that works a little bit better for those buyers to sit down and really walk them through how we can support them, um, work with them on, on developing events, you know, with, with Stephen and, 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 cannabis college and all the things that they're doing, I'm able to kind of have my foot in the door to keep the conversations going when, you know, our distributor partners, you know, inevitably have other priorities that they need to look at as well. So where I sit here is just supporting my brand, supporting my retailers, supporting the customers and supporting the distributors. So a little bit of a busy body kind of day to day, but I love it because I get to do something different every day and and meet great people in this space and and kind of keep it all connected and revolving a little bit. <laughs> all right. Um, so I think I, for everyone in this room, and I don't know where people are because I know the, the, you know, program was wanting to start a beverage or maybe have a beverage and you're trying to build it further or sell more of it. Um, this whole kind of model where, you know, brand owner, supplier support, distributor is for scale, like the only way you guys are entering the, you know, CPG, the consumer packer goods industry. There is no, I don't think there's any sector of industry that is more competitive, more saturated than that industry. Right. Um, and so just, I would say no one like you got to work your tail off. You got to eat, sleep, breathe, live this, this brand and give that supplier support. Cause as a retailer, you know, the, the products and, and depth in the portfolio I buy from Hohenstein's, uh, the one, the brands that they carry that have direct supplier support that are in my stores, doing tastings in my stores, you know, cross promoting on our social medias with us, all that stuff they have like billboard effect across my shelves with the majority of the products that they make. Um, because 
I'm a massively busy person just trying to run like the books and keep staff in my, on my, you know, employees in my store. And so if I'm getting that help as a team effort, um, that is massively valuable to me, even more so than, you know, like price structures and deal buys and things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say, again, going back to that, uh, modest weird we've really hung on to specifically our distro rights um we're about to turn eight years old um, we have a pretty large uh footprint across the state pretty saturated throughout the entire greater metro duluth rochester mankato st cloud fargo moorhead are all pretty covered it's the gaps in between um and that's by design um 100% agree with these guys about the support and the freight and the logistics that go into it. Um, I would, and coming from a beer background, this is really exciting because in the world of beer and brewing, there's franchise law that when you sign on with a distributor, you're entering a contract that is extremely difficult to get out of. Um, you don't have to deal with that on the cannabis side. I hope it stays that way forever, <laughs> but definitely be aware of the, their plan over time, you want to see just as much as you are pitching yourself to them and you, you're showing your passion and your um, your story. Um, you want to know who is out there representing your product because once it's out of your hands, that's somebody else that is representing your product. And again, with all due respect, because there's tons of brands out there that could not hope to get off the ground or have the reach that they do without a distributor, but you want to make sure that you're picking the right one. And right now, uh, Modest is actually finally shopping around some outstate beer rights to try and fill in those gaps. And everything is conditional on THC has to come with it. These offers were so they're hungry for brands. They're trying to capture market share with it. Like everybody's just kind of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks kind of to your point of like, you're not curating specific brand necessarily, but you're just trying to get product on the shelf and that's kind of showing in, in how saturated it is. Um, I think hanging on to that as long as you possibly can. I think there's some people that have gotten a really good product started, launched off the ground, have a great network. And then the first time that they get an order for 40 cases going somewhere, they that won't fit in their car. They panic and they give up 30% off their top line to a distributor that, can promise to take them everywhere, which is awesome. Um, but now that's the other thing to calculate in. That's not free. That's not a partnership. So there, I've also seen a lot of people with a really good competitively priced product then have to go and build into a, a, a distributor model where obviously they're taking something for all of that freight and warehousing and storage. So factoring that in almost from going back to formulating your product, um, you want to stand out and you want to be able to do it in a way that's cost effective. And if you are counting on a distributor to get your stuff where it needs to go, you got to factor in another, you know, 30% before it gets to that wholesale price that gets marked up at retail and hits the shelf. And if that happens and you're suddenly $6 higher than a bunch of the competition, it's going to have to taste really, really good <laughs> at this point. And that's a struggle for a lot of people. And you don't, and then where does that compromise come in? Are you cutting corners on the product side and, and making something that's cheaper and easier to create so that there's room for all these other hands to touch it before it gets to uh, a consumer? Or are you going to buy a panel van and, <laughs> and hang on to that a little longer and try and make those 40 case drops yourself? Um, right. Yeah. U-Haul is awesome. Uh, <laughs> those, uh, those single apartment, uh, 10 foot trucks are like 50 bucks for the day. You can do some real damage if you're, if you're organized. Exactly. Yeah. Menards, 20 bucks an hour at Menards. I love it. No, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I hear a lot of notes of there's similarities between beverages, be they cannabis or be they alcohol. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn by looking at distribution of the creation of alcohol beverages that we look at, at cannabis. One thing that I think we're seeing, not that I think that I know that we're seeing a lot of right now is new product launches. A lot of people saying this is a new product that I either want to bring into the market in Minnesota or that for the first time I'm creating. Can you talk about what things you've seen that have made a successful product launch? Things that maybe are notes of, wow, that really went well versus, hey, maybe don't do that next time. Either alcohol or cannabis. Lots of similarities. Yeah. Uh, and again, speaking from modest perspective, we do. Sorry, I, should, I can stop prefacing it. You know where I work. Um, we do. We do. Uh, 
Hold on. Yeah. Uh, we do a lot of um, not people approach us for Copac because they want a year round white label product that they can sell full time and make their main gig. We're not set up for that, but we are very into collaborating um, and doing one off limited releases to boost brands that we believe in that are maybe not already in beverage or are in the edible space and want to try it out and see what that would be like and, and get the reach that we have with that kind of market saturation and all these liquor stores bars, restaurants, whatever. Um, and that I think is always more attractive when you have something like a can of connect, when you have a, a one spot where there's going to be a lot of eyes on it right away. And then it's about right sizing that batch um, down to the numbers of like, what is the attendance of this event? How many cans, what is the average consumption per attendee of can? And then how do we right size that batch with a little extra for retail? Um, Etc. So I think having a real plan as far as how are you going to get eyes on it? Where is it going to go? Um, and again, it's just planning. I don't know. I think a lot of what's going to be <laughs> has been and will be discussed today is just having a plan and doing your homework before any liquid ever touches a tank um, and understanding your market and who you want to get this in the hands of before you start. And I think being not afraid of that plan to fail at times um, and, you know, sticking with it, right? Like this is, if this is startup, you got to know that um, nothing ever goes according to plan. Uh, what was the question again? Just sort of like what lessons can be learned on like a successful product? Oh, yeah. Doing something new, trying to share with the world. What kind of tips would you give someone doing that for the first time? Um, I think, I guess from like a retailer's uh, perspective, um, I think our, what I find with new products I've brought into the store and that have sort of just like hit the ground running, you know, we're unique in the fact that it's kind of a boutique, you know, retailer, it's a niche market. Um, so I do like long sales staff training it's i it's a very guided sales experience from entering in our store and understanding the layout and we're driven by education uh and so very much like everybody gets a full experience uh to educate on all the products we sell um particularly a lot of that goes into either our like functional beverage section our you know medicinal mushroom stuff our kava root stuff or our cannabis section um, and so I would say that what I've seen successful is when all this sort of um, social backup on the direct in-person supplier brand support activates right alongside us. Uh, our guests now, we're, I mean, we're young, we're coming up on a year, but our guests are very engaged and I've noticed retaining this like education. So when there's brand supporters, suppliers telling the story, they'll sit down at my like back bar, ask really great questions and then continue to just like be loyal to that product for week after week. Uh, and when I came up in the fine wine and spirit industry on a distribution side, it was, you know, it was maybe 20, 10% of the time that you would see that residual from your like in-store tasting or educational efforts. Um, and a lot of people just be like, I'm going to go buy the thing that's being shown off this Friday and you get maybe a week of residual, right? Uh, so I think we're starting to see with cannabis because so many people are curious and so many people are taking to the education side of it. Um, that they are, we're building some brand loyalty, I think, faster in this space than I've seen in other CPG goods. Well, um, my brain's been spinning. I've done a lot of brand kickoffs in my career. Um, <clears throat> whether it's wine or beer, I feel like it's, there's always a seasonal something or other. Um, so I guess in terms of back to, let's just focus on kind of cannabis, um, new concept commercialization. Some of the things that I've seen, I guess, out in the market, I get to see a lot of, look at a lot of brands every single day. I am a very curious person. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to see where it's made. I'm going to see what you're doing. I'm going to look at ingredients, all those kind of things. So I really like to see 
information that's easily digestible. Um, if you're a brand new brand on that shelf, especially today, um, when when Wink was introduced into this market last summer, um, you know, we we were fighting for, you know, just some shelf space in these little eight foot sections. Maybe it was an end cap in some experiences. Well, flash forward, I started at the end of the year. We have some more people out earlier this year. And all of a sudden these eight foot sections are are, are 16 foot sections and now they're 24 foot sections. And um, there's so many brands out there here in Minnesota. We are in this Mecca and, and we're so lucky to see that variation and experience that as well and have the chance to try all these different things to find what works best for us. But what I struggle with and what I've worked with brands on in the past is how do you pull yourself off that shelf? Um, because again, you're marketing, you're, your information, you're delivering the engagement you're having with the customers, the tastings in store. If you're taking that time to go beyond that, 60 second elevator pitch of who you are as a brand in person, you're going to start capturing the trust of your consumers right off the bat. Know what you're talking about. Have people there that you can, you know, kind of control that script. Um, and, and that also having, again, going back to having those materials ready to go. If you can't be in your store, what is your packaging telling your customers? Are you telling them the full story? Are they understanding if like, ah, you know, I'm doing keto and I know this is zero carbs and zero sugar and this is okay for my lifestyle right now, if that's easily read even when you're not there, um, you're starting to gain that trust. If you have a shelf talker that's talking a little bit about, you know, where a Wink 2.5 little, little mini can would, would fit in your life, you know, if you can start turning the brains of your customers without even being there, it's such a strong strong thing to have, whether that's through social or whether that's in store, but going back to the retail support, Chris's team can't be in the store every single day. I can't be in these stores every single day. Logan can't be sitting behind the desk every single day controlling these narratives. We want to, believe me, every single one of us would love to be, I would love to be sitting out at my booth right now and <laughs> talking to everybody about Wink. Um, but I've got an awesome brand team um, that can can speak those words and, and relay those messages. And we've been you know graduating out of the the tetra packs and do a carton because we recognize that we can have some of that brand information that brand story um so i guess that would be i don't know if that really answered that question but i guess from my side <laughs> when it comes to like commercializing and kicking yourself off how can you be there without actually being there um you know really think about that and how you can get that message across cool yeah um so i think i'd I got a, a thing to not do and a thing to do. Um, I'll end on the thing to do because it's more positive. Um, but one of the things I've, I've seen kind of fail with launches, and again, I've, I've worked for a couple of suppliers as well, and we brought some in and, and not everybody's going to succeed. Not everybody in this space is going to make it. It's, it's a mathematical impossibility um, that everybody's going to be successful. Um, but the one bit of advice I would give is um, to, if you are going to spend any money on the marketing side of anything, or just spending the money in general, don't spend it on the distribution side. Don't give away free cases. Don't offer your time if you don't have it. Um, Cause anybody can sell something for free. It's really easy. I can give you a free case. You'll, you're going to bring it in and sell it. The thing that determines whether or not the brand's going to be successful is if that case sells through the retail. Doesn't matter if it gets on Logan's shelf. If it doesn't sell through, he's not going to order it again. And if you didn't pay for it on the first one, He's definitely not going to pay for it on a second one if the first one didn't move. So if you're going to spend the money, spend it on the pull through on the rate of sale. And, and we've seen like, uh, for example, the this in-store samplings and building that brand recognition and uh, customer loyalty. That's where you want to spend your money and that's where you want to get your consumers. Um, again, anybody can sell something for free. It's really easy. So just... Pay attention to that and also pay attention to your time. Your time is very valuable. Um, one of the, when I was the first year as a supplier, I worked every single weekend doing three to five hours worth of samplings. So for 49 weeks, I think I did that and uh, could do that at 26. I cannot do that at 40, could not possibly do it. Um, your time is valuable. So definitely uh, pay attention to that. Um, but as far as things that do work, um, the one thing that keeps coming to my mind is celebrate every single win you get. Um, no matter how big or how small it is, uh, 
early on, we had, we had been joking in this industry, in this category, a lot of the brands that were coming in were new to the beverage industry. And uh, there was one day where a, a, a retailer, a big uh, retailer opened up. Every brand that got in there, or we got a bunch of brands into this store, but anybody who didn't get in there was mad they weren't in there. Everybody who got in the store was mad that not all their products were in the store. Everybody who had all their products in the store was mad that it wasn't on the top shelf. And it was like, you guys, get we're we're in there. We did it. We got the sale. Now, like, let's celebrate it. But tomorrow, let's get back to work. Because um, honestly, the other thing we've been kind of joking more recently too is uh, punching orders and getting on the truck and doing your day to day. That stuff is super easy. We can punch those things all day long. 95, 99% of our job is fixing the problems that happen with all the other stuff. So if everything worked perfectly every single day, we'd go into work, we'd high five and go home, but we don't, we all spend 40 to 60 hours a week working, um, because it's always getting to the next one. So just don't forget about celebrating anytime you have a win, uh, play it up and sell it and celebrate it publicly too. Uh, the social media stuff is huge every time you got a win. Um, and then again, if you can get it on all the levels, you got the distributor, the supplier, the retailer, everybody celebrating your win. It's just going to elevate it and make it a lot bigger. So. Thank you. Any questions that people have yet here? Pass over the microphone. Yeah. Hi. Um, so distribution and shelf space sounds crowded, to be honest, not, not to dissuade anybody from that, just kind of thinking outside the box there, what are your thoughts and opinions on direct to consumer e-commerce sales of beverages? And actually, honestly, it, it, it might surprise people because I'm actually, I, I, I'm for the, the DTC. Yeah. It's probably taking money out of me and Logan's pockets to not get it, you know, through our, through the distributorship or through a retail space. But this early on, um, I think just kind of everybody having access to it is huge. Uh, it's huge for the hemp industry and it's huge for the cannabis industry, um, as well. So I really do like to see it. My bigger concerns with it is with, uh, regulating it, making sure that the product you're getting is, you know, tested correctly, it's got the right stuff in it and kind of goes through a lot of the, the checks and balances that going through this system, um, it, it, it's kind of what we do. And it's uh, on the distributor level is uh, another kind of added bonus in a way to what we do is that we're kind of a one-stop shop for the city of Minneapolis or the state of Minnesota to regulate licensing, taxing and all that stuff. They could go to 2,500 retail shops or they could go to the you know dozen or so uh, distributors and regulate stuff at that level. Um, because on the alcohol side, if a, if a retailer doesn't pay their taxes, it's illegal for us to sell them anything. So, and that gets posted to all distributors. So it's way easier to police us than it is at the retail space. So that's where I do get in a little concerned with the DTC side is, is just kind of the lack of reg regulations and stuff. And, um, I would just like to see it get tightened up a little bit more on that side of it um, for the most part. So, yeah, I know Logan had something to say. I'll keep mine short, but um, you know, we do have a DTC side of our business and what it's allowed for us to do is we scale uh, warehouse beverage has touched a multitude of States. I think at our, you know, highest, I think it's a total of about 17, but we've had to pull back. We've had to make changes, regulation, processing partners, um, so a lot of things come and go, but being able to have a DTC model still allows us to expand into markets where, again, maybe their state legislation or their state structure, we, again, back to being how blessed are we to be in this market during this time, because as chaotic as it is, like, we're kind of at the forefront of, like, what's, you know, we're setting the standard of, of what's going to work, but when you're in these markets, um, you know, and you don't have access to this, and this is a category you want to learn about, we've been able to still enter markets and engage with consumers, you know, at that level. Whereas maybe on the flip side, their state legislation is kind of a wide open, um, you know, 
just wide open. <laughs> so it allows us to, um, you know, everything's coming out of the same warehouse for us. So whether it's DTC or, or it's going out to our, our state distributor partners or our dispensary channel um, distribution system. So um, for, for us, it's all the same. Um, and, and I really do take pride in kind of our, our consistency and regulations. And I mean, Minnesota, our product is special to us because we're our own packaging and the certain things that you need and the cutouts on the bottom. So you know, just taking the time to do that where it makes sense, like a Minnesota, but then where we can still get our foot in the door, um, you know, in Arkansas and Louisiana's or Texas's of the world where, you know, I don't know if we want to Wisconsin dive in, dive down that alley quite yet, but we can still get product to them um, if, you know, they know that it's a product that they want to get. Two quick things. So I am uh, building out and get ready to launch the e-commerce, the online sales portion of Zero Proof. Um, and through that learning, uh, the back to sort of the weight of this product on freight and logistics, um, you're and then giving up margin percentage because you're essentially paying these distributors to move that on their trucks, use their sales teams to sell it to these retail accounts. You're almost potentially paying more to drop to pay to ship that product direct to consumer depending on how far you're going with it um if you're looking at like hard cost of goods and adding your freight charges to it um and then there's a second thing i was going to say those ripped off ears i can't remember dt oh and then the other thing i was going to say is <laughs> if you i uh, you know thinking that the distributors the shelf space is very you know saturated which it is in this market for sure in minnesota uh the internet when it comes to direct consumer is even more saturated saturated on these products yeah that's pretty much where i was going to cover if you like if you think it, it, it took it right out of my mouth if you think a store shelf is crowded like the internet is infinite and i see stuff on my instagram feed all the time that i know is not compliant but it's showing up on my feed so like crazy um and yeah the the freight thing i again like that's actually i'm gonna walk back a little bit of my hang on to your distro as long as you can uh that is one thing that we're interested in in other states like that's there's potential there but i'm all down to uh work with those distributors that do only dtc shipping they've got if that's all they're doing and their whole thing is to drive that algorithm and those advertisements get that in front of the right people that are already buying you know if there are, there is a subset of people out there that buys six different mismatched cans from in this huge catalog online um to have a weekly standing order or a subscription service or something like that um i would rather go park a pallet with somebody like that than spend a whole bunch of time figuring out drop shipping um setting the the logistics that go into that i've already talked to a few people in michigan that are similarly just a, a, the modest of michigan basically is up in the up and they're doing a ton of that but they've taken on all that overhead and it's you're giving up that margin but i'm not employing somebody to pack up orders and ship them uh that alone i mean shipping samples to the lab is <laughs> several hundred dollars a, a batch uh so um again know when and where to outsource i think is hang on to your product as long as you can but if there's something that requires you to create a whole new department for your little three-person company <laughs> uh start looking at ways that you can maximize that if you're going to give up margin i think that's a way to do it is let somebody else handle it i really appreciate that so then the last question that i have today is will you guys help me bring my pickle beverage to no no, no i'm just kidding no no no. no 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 that's really all that we've got time for today let's give our panelists a round of applause Yeah, thank you guys so much for being on our panel today. Thank you guys so much for coming to our first panel today. There are two more panels going on throughout the day, so definitely be sure to check those out. Thank you guys so much for coming to Canna Connect. Have a great rest of your day.
Northern Lights is a Minnesota Cannabis College production. This episode was produced by me, Tanner Barris, and by my co-hosts John Barty and Marcus Harkis. Production assistance from Shayna Payton and Steve Eigenman. Today's episode is presented by North Star Law Group, your trusted partner in Minnesota's burgeoning legal cannabis industry. The information provided in this podcast does not and is not intended to constitute legal advice, but is instead for general information purposes only. Information shared may not constitute the most up-to-date or legal information. No listener should act solely on the base of information provided without first seeking their own legal counsel. The opinions and views expressed on this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the Minnesota Campus College. Please listen responsibly.